If you were just to believe the techno-optimists, you would think that we are on a highway to heaven on earth and the self-driving buses are speeding up at an exponential rate. On the other hand, if you just listen to the techno-pessimists, we're clearly going straight to hell in a handbasket. But most of us, and I think that's most of us in this room, that we perceive technology as a source of both promise and productivity, and yet there is considerable disquiet. Disquiet about the overall trajectory of scientific discovery and technological innovation, and disquiet about specific areas of research. So how, as we are reaping the benefits of emerging fields of research, how can we minimize the risks and the undesirable, undesired societal consequences through ethics and engineering and oversight? I've often used the self-driving car as a metaphor for the problem we're dealing with. Technology is moving into the driver's seat as a primary determinant of human destiny. And there is even the rather melodramatic possibility that we are inventing the human species as we have known it out of existence. So in this talk, I'm just going to quickly focus on artificial intelligence. Later in the afternoon, I'll be on a panel, and we will talk about biotechnologies. I'm just going to talk about AI, and I'm going to talk about the many ways in which we can encode ethics. Encode ethics through principles, encode ethics through engineering, and encode ethics through AI governance. And I won't even get around to talking about the ways in which we can encode ethics through the practices of industries and corporations. First, let me mention AI ethics in general. Ten years ago, there was about two dozen of us who even talked about this subject. Now there are thousands. There are thousands who are staking out different positions, different roles within the field. But ethics is not just about constraints. It's not just about saying no. Oftentimes, it's just setting parameters, helping industry know what, where they are dangers or what they'll be responsible for, and it opens up doors to innovation. It's also about navigating uncertainties. And more importantly, it's about maximizing the good. So maximizing the good, AI for good and AI for all, that's just as much ethics as restraining things that we do not want to take place. Now, there are a long list of principles that have been arising in the field of AI over the last few years. And that's fine, but the bigger task is going to be how are we going to implement those principles? What kinds of laws, what kinds of regulations will we put in place? How can we ensure that the technologies act, act appropriately? How can we ensure that the industry players act appropriately? And as I said, I'm going to get around to talking about specifically how values can be engineered into the machines themselves. This is a scatter chart. Um, it analyzed about 40 different principles, lists of principles for AI ethics. And in fact, according to the best of my knowledge, we now have 44 different lists. This was put together by Yi Chen, uh, an AI researcher at the University of Peking. And he surrounded his scatter chart with a symbol in Chinese which stands for optimizing symbiosis. He thought that that captured what we're trying to do with AI ethics. There have been many principles put forward in these different lists. Excuse me. But most of the lists overlap, and nearly all of them refer to privacy, refer to somebody being accountable, to holding accountability. They refer, they refer to bias and fairness. It has become a new issue, not a totally new issue. But throughout the history of computer science, we've known that garbage in, garbage out. And that's as true for the learning algorithms, the deep learning algorithms we have today. If there are biases in the input data, whether those biases are gender, whether those biases are income, whether those biases are racial, there will be biases in the output. And the data we have so far for input is biased, so we need to analyze both the input data and the output data to understand those biases. 
learning algorithms and complex systems in general also have a problem of transparency. How do we know how they came to the conclusions that they came to? There is no transparency, there is no understanding of the way many of these algorithms work. If we can't explain how they work, or they can't explain for themselves how they work, then we should be very cautious about putting them in charge of mission-critical applications, particularly applications that if something goes wrong, we can't determine after the fact forensically why that went wrong. So this leads us to a kind of caution about where the kinds of computer systems we're developing today actually should be employed and where they should not be employed. Now there's a whole list of issues that have come up. There's concern around behavior and attitude manipulation. This has become prominent with, with the manipulation of public opinion through social media. We've seen the results of that in England and in the United States. But as technologies become more sophisticated, we're going to see that happening in ways that's hard to even recognize that it is occurring. There are issues around surveillance. Countries are going to differ to what extent they will allow these technologies to be used for surveillance. Some countries will resist surveillance seriously. Others, in light of, of terrorism and activity that has created fear among the populace, will be forced to introduce surveillance techniques. But we should be very careful to not encroach upon individual rights. Then there's technological unemployment. That's Sir John Maynard Keynes' 1930 term for the long-held Luddite fear that each technology would rob more jobs than it actually creates. Whether that will be true with artificial intelligence is hard to say, but I'm very much of the conclusion that regardless of what happens in the long run, there will be periods when there will be mass disruptions in different areas of work. And I'm quite fearful that if that is the case, that poor countries in Africa and elsewhere in the world are going to be the ones that are going to suffer that the most seriously. So should, we should be planning and taking measures right now for the advent of the possibility of technological unemployment and be careful about taking very short-term jobs that may actually undermine our society as they disappear in the future. There are existential risks, concerns around superintelligence, um, artificially intelligent systems that are smarter than human beings. I don't think that's a near-term concern, but it's nice that we have researchers thinking a little bit about that. And finally, there's lethal autonomous weapons. That's weapon systems that can pick their own targets and dispatch, kill people with little or no human intervention. Machines should not be making life and death decisions about machine, about humans. Algorithms should not be making life and death decisions about humans. When we talk about lethal autonomous weapons, we are not just talking about drones with facial recognition software that pick out presumed terrorists and dispatch them. Lethal autonomy is a feature set, and that feature set can be added to any weapon system, including a nuclear weapon or a high-powered munition. So we either need to find a way to ban such weapons, or if a ban is not impossible, we need to put a very high threshold on meaningful, accountable human control. Oh, wrong direction. Okay, good. <laughs> Now, lethal autonomous weapons and self-driving cars are just the tip of an autonomy iceberg. There will be so many other kinds of autonomous features that come into play, and the problem with autonomous features and systems is that they threaten to undermine this long-standing principle that there is an agent, either a human, or a corporate agent that is responsible and potentially culpable and liable for the harms caused by a system. Going down a route where no one is accountable is truly dangerous for humanity. We need to raise the threshold on accountability and not lower regardless of short-term gains. Now let me talk just for a minute about the way in which we can engineer values into the machines we build. 
One approach is known as value-added design. It has other names, but the basic idea is that you make the values part of the design specification given to the engineering team. So right now, an engineering team has a design specification to ensure that the system they produce is safe. And safety may requ have requirements like make sure the servos don't overheat. That's a component that would be in many robotic systems, for example. But we can add to those design specifications values. Make sure the system protects privacy. Or make sure that in designing the system, you predetermine who will be held accountable should the system fail. If that is the responsibility of the design team, it may direct them away from one dangerous platform to a safer platform, particularly if the ones who are going to be held accountable are the corporations that are producing the systems. So value-added design is one way in which we can move forward. Another way we can move forward is called machine morality or machine ethics, computational ethics, artificial morality, and more recently it's been called value alignment. Now, I'm best known for having mapped this field in its earlier incarnation um, in a book that I co-authored with my colleague Colin Allen called Moral Machines, Teaching Robots Right from Wrong. And the idea of this field is how do we implement sensitivity to moral considerations in computers and robots so that they factor them into their choices and actions. This field is driven by many questions. Do we need artificial moral agents? When, for what? Do we want machines making ethical decisions? Then the age-old question, whose morality or what morality should we implement into these systems? And finally, how can we make ethics computationally tractable? Can machines actually make ethical decisions? This little chart is going to give you just the sense of what I'm talking about here. If you see on the vertical axis, we have autonomy with increasing autonomy. And on the horizontal axis, we have sensitivity moving to a high level of, of sensitivity. Consider this spot at the vertices. A hammer belongs there, no sensitivity, no, no autonomy. But just a little ways up, you might put a thermostat that it, with a change in temperature would turn your air conditioning on and off or turn your heating on and off if you're in a colder climate. Today's robots, they have very little autonomy and very little ethical sensitivity, or the ones that we have deployed have what we refer, refer to as operational morality. Operational morality means the values they give expression to have been hard-coded into the, by the engineers, and they represent the values of the engineers and the values of the corporations that produce the system. But we are just moving into a realm that we refer to as functional morality. And functional morality means that you can't always predict the, the circumstances that, the, that they are going to encounter, and therefore your systems need some kind of ethical subroutines through which they that they utilize to make decisions. Now, off in the distance, everybody wants to talk about full moral agency and when will computers be equal to us or will they be superior to us. That's still in the long distant future because it's very difficult. Anybody who has thought deeply about this problem realizes that it's very difficult to even bring functional morality into a system. And the systems we have so far are moral in the most cursory of senses. They have no understanding, they can't engage in any sophisticated reflection, and they still need human decision makers in the loop of, decision, of, of action. My colleague, Roman Jampolsky, I think he put it very well when he said, those who say that AI ethics is hard are unreasonably optimistic. 
Now, I'm just going to finish up with one or two minutes about governance. The speed of technological innovation is moving so rapidly that systems come into place long before we, we create ethical legal oversight. This is known of as the pacing problem. And governments are ill-placed to actually regulate them. So can we put in place some more agile, adaptive form of governance? I and my colleague, Gary Marchant, uh, gave this attention some years back, and we came up with a new model for governance. Now understand I'm using the governance word, not the government word. So governance includes a lot of things, including whether problems can be solved technologically rather than through regulations. And we propose governance coordinating committees to to manage the various stakeholders. These would be issues managers. Uh, these would coordinate activities. They would do comprehensive monitoring of a field. They would flag issues and gaps and look for creative solutions to those issues and gaps. In many cases, those creative solutions could be feasible engineering solutions. More often than not, they will be what we refer to as soft law or soft governance, which includes standards, industry practices and procedures, laboratory uh, requirements, insurance policies, a whole flock of mechanisms that don't necessarily have the enforcement capability of government, but oftentimes they can be effective. And if they can't be effective, then and only then do we go on and look to government regulations to put in place ways of ensuring that we can enforce that these activities are followed. But the problem with government regulations is that they tend to become entrenched. They create bureaucracies even when the technologies have changed and the bureaucracies are no longer functional. So here we favor soft governance, but the basic idea here is we'd like to put in place a credible and trustworthy governance mechanism, a, a mechanism worthy of trust. Now there'll be a lot of implementation problems with this, but we do, have, we do have countries looking at this model, trying to adapt it, sometimes utilizing it for neuroscience, sometimes utilizing it for food security and other areas. But I'm proposing specifically now that we consider this for artificial intelligence, and not just on a country or regional level, but we try and put a mechanism like this in place internationally. And therefore, I've taken on the lead responsibility for organizing an international congress for the governance of artificial intelligence. We expect to convene next April, and by the end of July, we hope to be announcing the host city for this event. But we need your help. We need your participation. We need representation from Africa, from India. We need representation. We need meaningful rep representation, meaningful inclusion, not the patronizing inclusion of those in North America and Europe pretending to make decisions for all of humanity. So hopefully those of you who have an interest in this area, you'll keep an eye out if you want to be of help please contact me. We are putting organizing committees together. So thank you very much.